From Washington, this is VOA News. I'm Victor Beatty reporting. Kurds claim another victory against the Islamic State in Syria. Kurdish-led forces have captured more territory from the Islamic State group in northern Syria. Backed by U.S. coalition airstrikes, the YPG fighters with allied factions claim to have seized the town of Ain Issa. If true, that would put the Kurds about 50 kilometers from Raqqa, the IS self-declared capital of its caliphate in Syria and Iraq. While U.S. defense officials have not confirmed that Ain Issa and a military base have fallen to the Kurds, White House spokesman Josh Ernest Tuesday spoke of Kurdish progress against IS in northern Syria. This is, I think, an indication of how critically important it is for the United States to have a capable, willing, uh, and effective partner fighting ISIL on the ground. Kurdish fighters, backed by U.S.-led coalition airstrikes, recaptured the contested town of Kobani near Turkey in January and have since been chipping away at IS control in other areas. The Rwandan government denounced the arrest of its intelligence chief in the United Kingdom at the request of Spain, which seeks him on war crimes allegations, as unacceptable and an outrage. Karenzi Karaki was detained at London's Heathrow Airport Saturday, is to appear in court Thursday for his alleged role in reprisal killings during the 1994 Rwandan genocide. Jordi Palo is a lawyer representing Spanish and Rwandan victims of the killing. We are considering international uh, crimes, the five uh, big uh, international uh, crimes, and there's a commitment not only uh, of the British authorities but uh, of the Spanish authorities and the states uh, con considering the international convention. Rwanda's foreign minister denounced the arrest, saying Western solidarity in is, is demeaning Africans and is unacceptable. This is VOA News. The U.S. hosted China for a seventh strategic and economic dialogue with Vice President Joe Biden Tuesday, saying the world's two biggest economies must learn to work together. I need not tell you all that are participating. We have a lot of hard work to do, but we have to keep at it day after day after day after day. This relationship is just too important. Not only we depend on it, but the world depends on our mutual success. To put it bluntly, the world is depending on those of you in this room to continue to work through those issues. Those issues include maritime tensions in the South China Sea and cybersecurity. Referencing competing maritime claims, the vice president said responsible countries adhere to international law and keep international sea lanes open. Treasury Secretary Jack Lew expressed concern about Chinese government-sponsored cyber-enabled theft. China's Vice Premier Wang Yang acknowledged that on some issues, consensus eludes the two countries. The top U.N. envoy to Mali asked the Security Council Tuesday to provide the country with a peace dividend following last week's agreement with Tuareg rebels. Mangdi Hamdi called on the council to quickly approve funds for water, electricity, and schools for Malians. He said re-establishing basic social services is crucial as thousands start to return home. The peace accord opens prospects for Mali's recovery and long-term perspectives with a view to reversing the setbacks and used by the political and security crisis. Scores of displaced people and refugees are returning home in spite of pressing humanitarian needs. He said the reconstruction in Mali will be more difficult than destruction, saying ceasefire violations in the north are a stark reminder of the complexity and unpredictability of the security environment. At least 10 more killed, dozens wounded, when a girl detonated explosives Tuesday in a market in the Gujba district of Yobe State in northeast Nigeria. On Monday, a teenage girl killed at least 20 in the Borno Sea capital, Maiduguri. There were no claims of responsibility, but suspicion has fallen on the insurgent group Boko Haram, 
which has kidnapped young girls and women and used many of them for attacks in its six-year effort to establish an Islamic caliphate in northern Nigeria. Nearly 700 have died in a heat wave across Pakistan's southern Sindh province as morgues overflow with the dead and overwhelmed hospitals struggle to aid those clinging to life. Most of the fatalities have been reported in Karachi, the country's largest city and commercial hub. The Sindh provincial government issued a state of medical emergency after the electricity grid crashed, causing widespread power outages as the temperature climbed above 43 degrees Celsius. The opposition lashed out at the government, blaming the deaths on rolling blackouts. I'm Victor Beatty, VOA News. That's the latest world news from VOA.